pleasure to be back here. Uh, we have had a wonderful time working on this project, and one of the most exciting things about it has been the involvement of the board from the very beginning, really, and the um, remarkable opportunities we've had to work with you throughout, um, starting with a board workshop very near the beginning where we really had an opportunity to sit down and talk, I think, individually and work through some of the trade-offs that um, your agency will be facing. And so as important as the specific lines that we've ended up suggesting that you draw on the map are the principles, the trade-offs that we've had a chance to talk about together throughout the project and uh, the opportunities that you have then, I hope, to make, to make clearer choices as you move forward. So as um, like Jared listed most of um, the things we've done in the course of the project, these have been the major uh, tasks. Um, we basically proceeded through the, uh, uh, you, the board, you, you, the board have actually been here for many of them, the uh, board workshop in January, the stakeholder workshop in January, which several of you attended, which really was a great opportunity to bring a larger um, representative sample of, of, um, um, of key interests from the, uh, from around your service area together to have a, a chance to actually work together on, you know, thinking through what this whole task of network design is and what the choices tend to be when we uh, sit down to work with it together. Um, and that led, and then the direction out of that, the advice out of that led us to go ahead and sit down with your staff and actually hammer out some specific ideas for your network, which we're here to present tonight. Um, we talked a lot, uh, as you'll remember in the stakeholder workshop, I, um, I put quite a bit of effort into helping people think about this question of the ridership coverage trade-off. Um, transit agencies are being asked to do several fundamentally contradictory things, and one of the things that's very important is that we is that transit agencies be conscious of the extent to which they are pursuing a goal of maximum ridership, and when they do any of a number of things that pursue other goals, um, that they be conscious of that. One of the one of the main concerns that we often have in the transit industry is that things that are done for a non-ridership purpose get incorrectly described as failure when they are in fact just things done for non-ridership purposes. Um, so uh, we had this conversation about the uh, inevitable trade-off between ridership goals, which are simply maximum ridership, and coverage goals, which tend to be all of the very important reasons why transit agencies run service that they know will be relatively low ridership, and that includes the um, social service needs that are present in every part of the community, even for services that not many people would ride. And it also includes the expectation of all parts of the community that there be some access. Um, and the um, question as I phrased it and as we discussed it extensively in the uh, stakeholder workshop was really right now about 65%, about two thirds of your service is where it would be if ridership were the only goal would you like to turn that dial? Would you like more or less of it to be focused on a ridership outcome? Understanding that as you turn the dial toward a ridership outcome, that tends to mean somewhat less of the most unproductive coverage services. And some need in particular to design those services to be um, more rigorously efficient in the way they provide coverage. And the answer we got from the stakeholder workshop was pretty strong that there's a comfort with turning it a little bit. Uh, toward about 75, but that certainly, you know, there was there was not enthusiasm for going massively um, toward ridership in a way that would cause major losses in coverage across um, the low density parts of the community. Um, we asked a bit about what people felt was a lower limit of acceptable ridership, but we got a range of views somewhere in the range of five, 10, 15 boardings an hour. Um, a, a, a level below which, uh, below which even coverage service is hard to justify. Five boardings an hour is interesting. That's the lowest performance of any route in your current system. Um, we asked about Saturday service, and this has been a very difficult conversation because I think it's understood that you continue, uh, transit in the Salem region continues to miss a number of market opportunities at, um, by not being able to be available for people who work five days a week um, in, uh, and have weekdays off. And that's many, many people in the service sector, in particular in the retail sector, where demand actually tends to peak on the weekends and you're likely to have weekdays off. 
And so a transit system that's not there on the weekends is not there for that. The other thing we've observed in many other cities, um, and I don't know that it would be that different in Salem except to some extent the effect of government employment, um, is that in many cities, Saturday midday services start, start, Saturday midday ridership is starting to reach the levels of weekday midday ridership. Obviously, the peak is a different matter. It exists only on the weekdays. But the, but the all day, all the time pattern is starting to be very high on Saturdays, and obviously that's not something you can achieve at this point without weekend service. We, um, we asked a lot about Saturday, we asked about Saturday service and talked about it and, the, and talked a little bit about the possibility of, you know, would you actually cut weekend service in order to fund Saturday service? There was some openness to that. But our view also is that um, going just a little bit into Saturdays, going just into Saturdays and not into Sundays, for example, going into Saturdays but not being able to be there, for example, in the evening, which is actually what a lot of Saturday demand is about, um, is going into the evening, probably would not get you that much and probably would not really satisfy any of the demands that are, that are pushing you in that direction. Um, and so I think we're, um, where we're going with the plan and I think the, the position that, that, that we want to encourage you to take is that there's a great deal you can do to improve the weekday network um, focus, first of all, on getting the structure of that network right, and then there's a separate conversation with the community about going into weekends properly with an appropriate level of service so that you can succeed. Um, one of the other things we observed in the plan is that um, there really isn't very much of a conventional commute peak on your system. Um, you look at the distribution of ridership across the day, and it's not particularly peaked at the obvious morning and afternoon times when we're used to uh, that peaking occur. The strongest peaking in the system, the busiest hour of the day, is actually the PM school hour, and that's not all that uncommon in cities of this size, somewhat followed by the PM peak. There certainly is still a lot of state government em uh, employees riding your system, not as many as when you had the state pass, um, and you still see that in, in some morning and afternoon peaking. But what we observed in your network was that a great, a certain amount of existing, of, of, in the existing service pattern, there's a certain amount of, ex of service going out just for the morning and afternoon peak period, and that doesn't seem to match the pattern of demand anymore. That's actually a good thing. Running a, a very brief periods of service is actually a relatively expensive and inefficient thing to do. You obviously have to pay somebody to come to work to work not very many hours, and that's less efficient than paying someone to work an eight-hour shift. So um, we generally suggested that we flatten out the level of service across the day, recognizing the relative flatness of the demand pattern across the day. And that's one of the ways that it's possible in the plan to afford, I think, the most exciting thing we're proposing, which is a significant expansion of the extent of high-frequency service, the kind of service uh, where, where a bus is coming soon all day, uh, and you can therefore you know, get around the city spontaneously. We made an observation also that there's quite a bit of excessive layover time and recovery time in the current timetables, and we suggest setting that at 15% a, at a, um, uh, of all revenue hours. It's higher than that now. Um, the other thing we observed is that there's currently a practice of bringing absolutely all of the buses to this location and having them sit here together for 10 minutes. And um, while, and that's actually a very long time, and for people who are traveling through downtown and onward to other destinations, that's a significant source of delay. What we recommend is that it is very important for buses to meet each other. It's what's called a pulse, where all the buses are scheduled to meet each other, but that's particularly important for routes that are not very frequent, where if you miss the bus, you have a, you have a long wait. And so it's very important that those buses take care to all meet each other so that, it, when, so that people can get off whatever bus and onto whatever other bus and not get stranded there. But now as we're talking about introducing more high frequency services, which are the red lines on these maps, services that come every 15 minutes all the time don't have the same need to necessarily be there with all the other buses. It's great if they are. But we have, cons we have the flexibility because at any time, really, whenever you, you're brought to the downtown transit center, one of these buses is going to be leaving soon. They don't have to be scheduled coordinated in such a way. And so we're recommending that 
uh, in general, that these, that these frequent routes not dwell nearly as long downtown. That, that is, has the very simple effect of speeding up a great many journeys uh, because these red lines, after all, these most frequent lines, are your highest demand routes. They're where the most people are traveling. And so the opportunity to get, say, from South Commercial to Kaiser and to save a lot, to shave a lot of time off of that trip uh, is fairly low-hanging fruit, we think, and something we recommend that you do. Um, where there are some recommendations in the plan, I won't go much further into this now, about the need to coordinate with land use and development agencies. There are a number of situations in your city where apartments in particular and other what we might perceive to be must serve or important to serve land uses have built in ways, have been built or designed in ways that's going to make transit service difficult. Um, and there's a need to, for all transit agencies, and I say this to most transit agencies, to be more proactive in engaging with local, um, with local land use authorities, primarily the, the two cities in this case, in helping to identify the simple things you can do to make those developments somewhat, somewhat easier to serve. These usually do not involve anything that changes the fundamental density or character or, or yield of development. It's mostly just a matter of helping people be aware of certain things, uh, certain features about, about the built form, about the way the streets are laid out and so on, that can have a huge impact on whether transit is, is possible, is viable. Um, so in our constrained network recommendation, which is here, and I think I'm, at this point I want to turn our attention to the map. Uh, um, actually, what I'm going to do is, is go through a few more things and then go to the map. Um, so in the, in the basic idea of the network plan, what you see on the right or in the middle diagram here is the current network color-coded according to frequency. The red lines are the high-frequency services where service is always coming soon. And as you see in the existing network, there's, uh, um, you have the Lancaster Drive corridor, you have the market and um, center corridors, it's not drawn all that clear, but you do have the River Road corridor only out to downtown Kaiser, not as far as the transit center because the routes diverge there. And so while there are a few red lines, they aren't actually fitting together into a network very well, and some very obvious corridor, high demand corridors like South Commercial aren't even at high frequency. Now I want to emphasize why high frequency is so critical. It real, the, the 15 minute frequency is really when people stop feeling like they have to build their lives around a bus schedule and start feeling like service is there where, whenever they need it. Light, it spot, more spontaneous kind of life becomes possible. And as a result, we tend to see 15 minute frequencies correlating with a significantly higher productivity. So this is why uh, given the decision to move uh, the, the emphasis a little bit more toward ridership outcomes, it makes sense to get higher frequency in those corridors where you have the land use patterns, the development patterns, the demographics, the demand that indicates transit could succeed. Those factors include density, the sheer number of people around each stop and number of activities, walkability, the ability of people to walk out to stops, um, um, the li linearity, the ability to run in simple straight lines like Center Street or Lancaster Road, and um, finally also continuity, the fact that we don't have to cross big empty gaps to get to various parts of the development. Um, now one of the things that's going to come up in this plan is that as we shifted from, as, as we developed this plan to shift from a somewhat more coverage-oriented network to a somewhat more ridership-oriented network, this, this outcome should be entirely predictable. Slightly fewer people have access to any service, but many more people have access to useful service. And while the number of people who have access to any service is like, you know, often seems like it ought to be the primary thing we concern, we concern ourselves with, of course, most of the people who have access to any service, to a, an hourly bus, a bus, a, you know, a bus making a one-way loop, something that's just not very useful, most of the people aren't using it. Whereas when we can deploy useful service, a larger share of the population tends to find it useful, which is why we tend to get these ridership outcomes. So these charts give you a basic sense of what the trade-off is likely to look like, namely that as you move from the present-day network toward the recommended network, 
the number of people who have access to any service goes down a little bit. But again, the service they had access to wasn't very useful and most of them weren't using it and we have ridership data that, help that, that we've worked with very closely, I want to emphasize, we've, we've, we've gone very closely through stop-by-stop -stop ridership in making those estimations. And that correspondingly, the payoff is that the percentage of people who have access to high frequency service, service that a lot of people would find useful, goes up. So that's the essential trade-off in that one chart. There's a very similar trade-off about jobs. Jobs with any access, most of it access that's not especially useful for those jobs goes down a little bit. But jobs with high frequency access goes up dramatically from about a third of the region to about half. So a huge increase in access to jobs, again constrained by the fact that we're talking about a weekday only network, so the retail and so on jobs are, are at some disadvantage. So that's the recommended scenario, and at this point it's probably good to talk briefly about to the maps. The key, I, as we've worked through this, I want to emphasize what happened after the last process that we had with you, which was the stakeholder workshop where we worked through um, a, a, a lot of these ideas. We then sat down with your internal team and our um, consulting experts who've done this many, who've done this in many, many cities. We sat down with that map, which shows exactly how many people get on at every stop in the whole system. We sat down with Google Earth and, we, and, and, and your own team's intimate knowledge of the city so that we could think of, we, we, had in, we had the knowledge in the room about every twist and turn and about you know, what's going on all over the city. And we worked through in very careful detail how we could take the resources of this network and deploy them in a way that would simply be liberating to a great many more people, largely by virtue of dramatically expanding the network of red lines. So whereas the network of red lines in the existing system, the high frequency network is very limited as you see, in the proposed network it gets significantly expanded with the Lancaster Drive corridor extended through connecting to a complete new river road corridor so that finally River Road and Lancaster Drive come together in Kaiser connecting at high frequency which doesn't happen now. We were able to add the South Commercial Corridor all the way down to near the south end of the city. The last available turnaround basically is where it ends. And uh, we were also able to bring a basic high frequency service to all of the high demand parts of West Salem, which is largely Edgewater and the uh, neighborhoods close into the south. Oh, that's helpful. that. Okay, that's good. So, um, so as you see, um, the, so again, the major expansions here, currently there's frequent service on Lancaster and River, but it doesn't connect frequently. You can't get every 15 minutes from here to here. That problem is fixed as these are connected through. Um, currently, you um, cannot get, you do not have any frequent service in South Salem. That problem is fixed with a um, uh, uh, with a very simple straight south commercial route down to the last available turnaround. We've been able to create this admittedly very squiggly route in southern West Salem. It is inevitably squiggly because the streets available and the pattern of development requires twisting and turning. But it does succeed in covering all of the high demand parts of West Salem, which tend to all be south of Glen Creek Road, and uh, do so now with very frequent service into the city. That's a huge transformation for a very, very high demand neighborhood. Uh, and a neighbor, um, and one of the other things I want you to notice is that the network is getting so much simpler. This is West Salem today. The area has one, two, three, four, five different route numbers in it, but they mostly represent complex patterns of service that is almost never coming when you need it because the green lines, which mean a bus once an hour. Um, so. Uh, what we've done by, what we've proposed is to focus instead on the frequency, on getting a service in there that's doing a simpler pattern. It may not go, there may not be a bus directly to where you're going, you may have to transfer. But on the other hand, it's coming soon, all the time, all weekday. Um, I guess I would also emphasize a few other expansions of high frequency service. We were able to cover Brown Road with high frequency service and, uh, in the proposed network, unlike in the existing one, with a routing coming in here that actually comes in from the back of the community college once we have the available roads. Um, 
And we've also been able to generate, to, to um, simplify a great deal the complexity of what's going on in Kaiser with, instead of this current situation with, with, um, with a couple of very awkward circulator routes coming out of Kaiser Transit Center, we've been able to propose, basic, first of all, this most important route, Red River Road, always doing the same thing every trip into Kaiser Transit Center, and then a Cherry Avenue route which flows through to the North Kaiser Loop, and um, which is kind of the secondary radial for Kaiser, and that just leaves one little circulator, which we, intent, which we expect to be a very low ridership coverage service, doing the last bit, little bit of what the 18 does today. I believe later on tonight you'll get a presentation uh, about dialogue or demand responsive options for that. Is my time up? <laughs> um, for that kind of service, and you can certainly think about that as something that, that is another option for that. This is a low ridership service it's designed to be. It's one of those 25% of the budget that we've set aside for coverage services. Um, a lot of other details in the network, I don't think I'll necessarily talk through all of the changes in detail. It's probably best if I stop at this point, and uh, let me make sure I have everything else covered in my presentation, and uh, just stop and take questions. And, and discussion. Thank you. Brad. Um, so I'm really excited to see all of these recommendations. So thank you so much for all your work. Um, one of the questions that I have is uh, do these colors represent bi directional uh, for each of, I know some of the routes currently are one direction, like the up in that area. Much of the existing system is one-way loops. The problem of one-way loop is that you can get there, but you can't get back, or at least you can't get back by the same reasonably direct path. We've tried as much as possible to make the entire system two-way. So if you see the number of little triangles here that are warning you about one-way service, a lot fewer of them over here. We still have that one-way loop on the end of State Street. Uh, we still have, inevitably, the one-way loop of North Kaiser. This is actually a two-way loop. Uh, it goes this way and then it goes that way so that you can ride two-way between any point on it. Um, other than that, the entire network is two-way. So is, is the, uh, the one-way a different color if it, um, like, for example, the 18, mm -hmm. which is the one through the, mm -hmm. the L over here on the, free, on the, uh, the proposed, is it? These are the same bus. Uh, let, me, let me clarify the colors again. As we've been talking all through the project, red means every 15, blue means every 30, green means every 60. And what happened here is, and honestly, this is a complete, this business of the 18, which is the L over here, is a completely detachable recommendation from the rest of the project. Um, we can probably do whatever you prefer. Right now, it is a continuous one-way loop every 30 minutes. We suggested it might be better as a two-way loop every 60 minutes. It's the same bus. It's just that instead of doing, instead of doing that, it would do that. Steve is next. Uh, it's your microphone, Steve. I know what um, is proposed in West Salem to alleviate no coverage at all, uh, other than Edgewater and the run out towards the apartments and the park and ride. Um, but you don't show any solution on your map. Um, I do know there are people that ride it because I ride it. Okay. And you've eliminated my ride. Mm-hmm. So what's your solution? Well, when we, um, there are several tiers to that, uh, several levels to that. In this exercise, we were taking a fixed budget and we were told, take it from a budget devoted about 65% to ridership to a budget devoted about 75% to ridership. And that means that the very, very most unproductive service is going to be hard to sustain because we're shifting the focus toward to put, spending a little less on very low ridership services. What's happening in the hills of West Salem is that the one dot happens entirely on one trip and it's a school trip and it's a function of the school. And if you mentally subtract that dot to understand what's going on all day, 
we can count the single digit numbers of passengers and the many stops with no passengers at all. So you can look at it by the, by the standard of the rest of the city and notice that it is essentially the, except for that one dot which happens on one trip, it is the lowest ridership area of existing service. Now, um, and there are features of the land use pattern that make that outcome not surprising to us. So you would serve it for a coverage reason. You'd serve it for that 25% of the budget you've set aside for coverage. And when we, but when we spread that budget across the entire city in this exercise, we could not, you know, the, the resources didn't get that far, given that because of the existing ridership and the land use pattern, it was essentially the lowest priority. So what can you do about that? Um, well, here's what we drew. We drew services that focus on where the ridership is and where the indicators of ridership potential are, which tend to be around this area, where we have some apartments and some, and some focal points, but didn't draw a service up into the hills. There are a variety of solutions that you could then bring to bear, and you'll, you may hear, hear later tonight about flexible service opportunities. Um, the key is if you were to decide to add a fixed route service back into here or anything else that's essentially directly operated at the same rates at which your uh, standard transit service is operated, that would be another bus. It would, I mean, the budget, for the, you know, that is not included in this particular, in this plan at the time. Yeah, I heard you say that earlier that if you increase coverage, then you'll, more people will use it. No, what I said was that. Um, like on, on uh, commercial. Yes, absolutely. That's true on commercial. And I was talking. I was talking about increasing frequency, not coverage. That's what. That's what I mean. Yeah, I was talking about increasing frequency. frequency. Yeah. Um, West Salem has had low frequency as an experience. So what that does is it discourages use by its infrequency. So you have eliminated the problem by eliminating the frequency completely. I couldn't support this unless there, 19 percent of the tax base comes from the area you've eliminated, because of the value of the homes up there, and it would be really hard for us to pass any change. And I know the dynamics of the West Salem Neighborhood Association and the activity there. I think it would be, we I think we need to address it somehow, and that's. For another discussion. Completely encourage you having that conversation. Absolutely. Um, I was just curious. You said we're going to have a discussion on dial a ride. Will that include Cherry Lift? If not, no. I, um, there's a, a Cherry Lift just was not part of this project. Mm -hmm. um, you will. Uh, my understanding is there's a presentation later on tonight about flexible service options for some of these same very low ridership areas. So other ways, you know, other things you could do instead of some of these green lines um, that would be, that would also be other ways of providing basic lifeline coverage to those areas where ridership expectations are always going to be low. So is there a report of the impact to uh, Cherry Lift under our current requirements with this plan that we're being presented tonight? Uh, if I'm understanding your question correctly, this has no impact on Cherry Lift because our current Cherry Lift policy is to provide Cherry Lift service within the UGB. It doesn't have a three-quarter mile room. So the Cherry Lift has no change with this plan. Well, what I meant, though, or could we potentially have somebody due to an existing route mm -hmm. who, due to the location of what the bus service they weren't calling cherry lift where now that we've switched it over, they will be. Right. It's possible when, where we have gone through and not retained an existing service, we, we can count the existing riders and, and they are so few that the likelihood of that, I mean, one or two, will one or two people do that? Quite possibly. Will it be enough to make a, a, any significant uh, difference in the cost of cherry lift? I would, I, I don't believe so. That's what I was looking for, just the impact, and you said basically you've taken that into consideration. John. Right. I had a question regarding 
one feature of the proposed plan that we don't see on the existing one, and that is these dashed red lines for um, limited daily trips or express. Could you talk a little bit about that? It seems to be all going from downtown to Kaiser. Oh, I'm sorry. These are, I, that's just a nomenclature change. Uh, they're shown in solid uh, pink here. I, I see that they're solid shown in dashed lines here, but they haven't changed. Uh, that's, just a cha that, that's, that's just a difference in the uh, graphical style of the two maps. The, the routes haven't changed. Those are the 91, 92 once a day services that you're familiar with. I see. Okay. The 1X Express to Wilsonville, the 2X Express to Monroe. Got it. They haven't Thank changed. you. Um, thanks, Jared. Um, I've been on the board so long that we've lost coverage for frequency, and then we've lost coverage for frequency, and I think this is maybe the fourth time that we've lost coverage for frequency. Um, and so I understand Steve's concerns. I also know that historically there haven't been a lot of riders, partially due to the land, not only the land use, but the terrain in West Salem as far as riders. Um, and, I could, and I have areas where I have had acquaintances who've asked me for service and they've never had service and they also have very much um, impact on our bottom line uh, as far as the um, overall. There is one part of the map that I'm a little bit concerned about looking at the new to the old map, and that's in a dense area with smaller houses that used to have 15-minute service and now has gone to hourly service, and with this map would be zero service, and that's the area along D Street versus the Market Street. And let me express my concern. Um, The D Street is heavily residential and in some areas fairly small houses and quite a few older folk. And Market Street is much more commer commercialized in that same area but is not necessarily the type of commercial that people would be taking the bus to. It's, you know, it's, it's got some engineers and some, you know, CPAs, not real high frequency commercial, and I'm just concerned that when people are living in an area that is just perfect for transit because it's designed with straight streets and flat and people can walk, that if you remove that even, if you think they at, at 75 can walk four blocks up to Market Street, they don't think they're probably going to be able to. It depends, of course, exactly where you are in that area, whether your closest route is market or center. Um, but uh, what I, what I, I, I'm glad you raised this, because D, D Street is almost a parable of the kind of trade-off that you have to think about when you're trying to optimize ridership. So D Street in the existing system is an hourly route, green in between two 15-minute routes, red. And so already, if you live there and you miss this bus, or if you live there and you want to go, it, never mind missing the bus, if you live there and you want to go downtown right now, chances are the fastest way to do it is not to wait 40 minutes for this bus, but to walk over here where this bus is coming every 15 minutes. That's the reality today for someone who actually just wants to get downtown or get out into Lancaster. And that's why the ridership is as it is, huge on center and market through this denser area and, and much weaker on D Street. Um, the, the other thing as you sort of zoom back and look at the whole system is that D Street is so close to center. And when you're thinking about whether to serve an area, it's not just a question of what's right there, it's also a question of how efficiently are we deploying this very scarce resource. And when we have two routes that are that close together, yes, I'm sure there are people here who don't like to walk to there, but in the larger scheme of things, these two routes are mostly serving the same people. The area to which they are useful is overlapping, right? 
they serve an overlapping area. And because these are so close, um, this was, in, in our view, an easier thing to question than many other segments where there really aren't alternatives. Um, and so, yes, um, uh, that's why you show the deletion on D Street, because fundamentally, everyone in this area is still close to excellent service, either on market or on center, depending on where they are. Now, I fully understand that there are going to be some people who are going to be resistant to the walk, but um, what we see in ridership outcomes is that most people are walking to the more frequent service already, which is why D Street ridership is not that helpful. And I, I, again, we've, we had a conversation about, uh, specifically about D Street at the stakeholder workshop. It's a very, inter it's a, it's a, it's a very um, kind of classic example of the kind of situation you have to think about when you're trying to move the network toward greater ridership if you choose to do that. And Jared, I think one of the real concerns that I have is because some of that ridership has lost and lost and lost because they used to have 15 minute service because that was the number two route. I rode it lots. You couldn't get a seat part of the time until Lancaster Mall if you were on the outbound. And it was a really heavy ridership and those people have made their investments, especially if they're, you know, their investment in their neighborhood and their personal investment and did ride it. And all that's happened is it's been cut and cut and cut. Um, Anybody else have a question? Okay, are we ready for conclusion? And Jerry, can I just can I just uh, verify that we're accepting the report? This does not mean that we're adopting the report, and that we will have lots of opportunity to talk to people about what what's doing and what's happening. And uh, we have staff back here that's going to be this and digesting it and spitting it out and making sense out of it, right? Well, and, and I hope that our writers are as well, because, you know, I, I come from an area where we've lost service and we've lost service and we've lost service and personally have lost service, so I can understand that. I move that the board accept the comprehensive service analysis as presented in attachments A through G. Second. I also move that the board direct the general manager to bring a recommendation for implementation that includes a public outreach plan to the July board meeting. I'll second that. Okay. It's all one second. All one motion. Yep. Okay, did you have something else? To... Nope, that's fine. Okay, anyone else have any comments? Okay, we're ready for a vote. Okay, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Jared, that is a wonderful report and you guys did a good job, really good job.